On behalf of Namitha Gokhale and William Dalrymple and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, welcome back to GLF's Brave New World. And I do hope you have a wonderful weekend. Those of you who missed our earlier sessions with Elizabeth Gilbert, Alif Shafak, Benjamin Moser, Jumpa Lahiri, Gloria Steinem, and so many others, you can catch them on our Facebook page, GLF LitFest, and on our YouTube channel, Jaipur LitFest GLF. Our official radio partner is Red FM Bajate Raho. Our session today on GLF's Brave New World is Ruskin Bond, looking for the rainbow, in conversation with Namita Gokhale. India's most beloved and prolific storyteller tells of his incredible journey. Ruskin Bond, who has penned over 100 books, joins Namita Gokhale in an inspirational session to share his vision of the joy, spontaneity, and clarity he brings to his writing and his life. Ruskin Bond was born in Kasauli, Himachal Pradesh in 1934 and grew up in Jamnagar, Gujarat, Dehradun, New Delhi, and Shimla. His first novel, The Room on the Roof, which was written when he was 17, received the John Riss Memorial Prize in 1957. Since then, he has written over 500 short stories, essays, and novellas, including Vagrants in the Valley and A Flight of Pigeons, and many more books for children. He received the Sahitya Academy Award for English Writing in India in 1993 and the Padma Shri in 1999. This is Ruskin Bond's birthday week. He turns 86, and it is our pleasure to have recorded him in advance from his house in Landor, Missouri. Namitha Gokhale is an award-winning writer, publisher, and festival director. She is the author of 19 books, including 10 works of fiction. Her latest novel, Jaipur Journals, was released in January 2020. Namitha Gokhale is also co-founder and co-director of the Jaipur Literature Festival. Please do comment by typing it into the comment section to also follow our handles. In case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues, you can find us on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Litfest JLF. And of course, you can hang in there on Facebook. Ladies and gentlemen, Ruskin Bond, looking for the rainbow and conversation with Namitha Gokhale. Hello, dear, dear, dear Ruskin. What a delight to have India's most beloved writer with us at the JLF Brave New World. I have so many memories of time spent with you, including, as you may remember, a very long ago birthday festrift in Masuri when you and I and the world were all younger. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember what a lovely time we had? You, you took us for a walk through the graveyard, if you remember. Uh, I think, um, I've stopped visiting graveyards ever since I got into my 70s, actually. So I think that uh, that particular walk happened um, probably 15, 20 years back. Hmm? Lovely. So um, now um, this is a birthday week too. And we want your friends, your fans, your admirers to wish you a very happy birthday. So any birthday thoughts about birthdays in general, yours and the world's? Yes. Well, I, you know, I've never been a, a great one for celebrating birthdays. It's only in recent years that, you know, um, readers or fans or, or publishers or, you know, people have sort of um, started... Um, noticing the fact maybe that I'm getting older and uh, need to have a birthday party now and then. Well, this year, of course, we're all locked up and, uh, and, f and I'll be really looking forward tomorrow to a quiet, peaceful birthday without tourists banging on the door <laughs> and without car horns blowing on the road beneath. So I'll be, I'll be here with my books. Uh, writing pad, comfortable bed to take a nap on, and of course, Bina and Rakesh will see to it that I get a, a great lunch and dinner too. Lovely. And a cake? Cake? You know, there, there will be a cake, but I'm not a cake person. Not a cake person. No, I, I'm into things like um, tikkis and chole pature and um, chaat and gold street food. Mm, um, 
not not much in the way of sweets. I will have to wait for a while till the virus gets over. I think I'll come over and celebrate a delayed birthday with you. So, uh, also, I'm told that this year, 2020, marks almost 70 years of your writing career. How many books have you written? I've asked publishers to research this, and I've received the most vague replies, over 100 books, or almost 200 books. So, how many exactly? Which are your favorites? Which genre do you enjoy the most? Well, publishers won't know exactly, because I've had so many publishers, too, over the years. And, um, but, and I haven't counted. So, uh, make a wild guess. Like actual titles would be up in, you know, around 150 or more. But some would be collections or anthologies, children's books too, which are very slim. So, I don't want to give the impression that I'm sort of working day and night and you know, turning out thousands and thousands of words. I'm not. Oh, I, that you have some elves in your <laughs> cupboard who write the books for you. Pardon? I said maybe there are some elves in your cupboards who write the books for you. That's true. There is a little demon somewhere or a devil that sort of uh, gets, helps, me, helps me do them. <laughs> and um, I started, started so young, you see. I was when just. Yeah, after, out of school, 16, when I started bombarding magazines and newspapers with little stories and articles and vignettes, that was 1951. Um, so, right, about 70 years. Yeah? And um, the first story that was published was in the Illustrated Weekly of India, which was then a sort of a popular family magazine. And uh, that was in the summer of 51. Right. Um, well, but a lot of stories came back in those days. So you shouldn't get the impression that I was a sort of big success overnight. I wasn't. And lots of rejections. And even my first novel went the rounds of publishers too before it finally got published. Which was that, the first novel? The, the world, that was when I, you see, when I, my mother packed me off to England in the end of 51. And, uh, and when I got there and feeling so homesick for India, I started writing this first novel of mine. And it was based on the journal that I'd kept in Dehradun uh, that particular year before leaving. So um, it was a combination of diary, which got turned into, a, into fiction. Um, and then, um, after going to two or three publishers or several, it finally found a sympathetic editor in in, uh, in Diana Atill, who was then a young a woman who was a, a very good editor, but she hadn't done much writing. Uh, she did later on uh, become well known as a writer. Uh, but anyway, she took me on and made me rewrite that book about at least three times. <laughs> Uh, before they finally agreed to publish it. Huh? So um, it was, um, I had to persevere and um, oh. work hard on it. Fascinating. Uh, so a lot of sometimes people think you just have an overnight success, you know, write a book, it's published and, and there's fame, but it, it's not like that really. As you will know, and as most writers as I know. Certainly know. Yes, but you've done so many genres and so many styles of writing. Which is your favorite? Um, I guess a, a lot of my work is autobiographical, although I, I, I fictionalize things very often. Huh? So I turn people I know, I put them into stories or I change them around. Um, I write a lot about childhood. In fact, before I started writing for children, I was writing about childhood, but, but sometimes for adults, sort of um, looking back into my own childhood, which was, which was uh, I won't say uh, very difficult, but it, it, there were times when it uh, was uh, lonely or traumatic. And uh, <clears throat> so that sort of came into my writing. And then um, as I got older, I started trying different genres, uh, writing about um, 
wildlife or the writing about nature, writing about um, the ghosts. Yeah, you're a master of the ghost story. The ghost story. And I have to confess, I've yet to meet a ghost. Huh? So, um, and I probably, and I don't want to. <laughs> but, <laughs> better to make them up. <laughs> yeah, better to make them up. Uh, tell us about your discipline of writing, of how you write, when you write. Usually in the mornings. It's, early morning is a good time. One is fairly fresh. What is early morning for you? Uh, well, it can vary from 7 o'clock or it can be 9 o'clock before breakfast. Hmm? Oh. Um, and then I sort of work up an appetite while I'm writing <laughs> um, because I like breakfast. Hmm? So if but I, I said I must earn my breakfast, so I'll write my 500 words or something around that. And, uh, and uh, in a notebook? It, yes, by hand usually. Mm -hmm. um, always I've written by hand, but of course in the old days I, you had to submit your work typed. So I would then I had an old typewriter for years. I still got it, but I don't use it now. But would you use the typewriter for your first draft, or even then you would no, try? I use it for the, the final draft, the one I submitted. And no. any particular kind of pen you're particularly fond of, or pencils, or any color? I use a ballpoint pen, and over the years I've become a bit partial towards the j color jamun, a purple. Oh, pen. lovely. Uh, I, I'm one for purple pens also. You like well, it goes back to the time when I was uh, in my 30s in Delhi and I was in love with a girl who always wore a purple uh, sort of dupatta or kameez. Eh? And we used to go to India Gate and eat jamuns, which are purple too, you know, purple juice. Hmm? Um, so I've sort of nostalgia, I, you know. I, <laughs> I have a tendency oh, to a beautiful insight. And, as, and after this interview, I'll tell you about my purple obsession. To go on from the color purple, which is a theme in my new novel, The Jaipur Journals, which is one of the few novels you haven't blurbed. But in this wonderful book of yours, uh, titled In the Beauty of All My Days, you say, we come into this world pure and innocent. But it doesn't take long for us to be tainted and corrupted by the warped civilization that prevails around us. It sounds a, a lot more lofty than you often write, but I know that you've written that from your heart. Mm. I want to know, you write for children, you write for grown-ups, and you write for the child within. Who exactly do you write for? How old do you feel inside you? Where is this child? This, this child who, which has never, who has never left you? Well, I think basically we write for ourselves, don't we? Yeah? Um, I think uh, uh, I've always, in a way, written for myself, huh? or maybe for an imaginary reader who is a projection of myself, hmm? or of the, or the ideal reader, you think, who's on the same wavelength. Huh? Um, but yes, and, and as for innocence, you know, I, uh, yesterday morning, I. I got up very early, five in the morning, and I looked out of the window, and there was a half moon in the eastern sky, um, and below it there was the glow of the sun, which was going to rise in a little while. So there was sun, moon, and sky all together, and I, it, it was so beautiful. Then I thought, you know, human beings are the only people who have the, or the only living things that have the intelligence and sensitivity to appreciate the wonders of nature. And yet, we are the all same, we too are the same ones who go out of our way to degrade it and destroy it. So what a contradiction it is. Um, after all, the animal world, beautiful though it is, they don't have the, they, they're not going to appreciate the sunset. So we think, <laughs> hmm? who knows? Who knows? All right. It's difficult to... Um... Like birds, birds certainly appreciate the sunrise. They, they oh. are the one in the highest of the uh, uh, branches, uh, uh, the one to greet it. And it has some visceral understanding of sunrise. Yes. And also of sunset. They, they, uh, as the sun sets, they begin their evening chorus. Any I think there's, there's, 
but they they are living in a way almost by instinct. Eh? Yes, um, as we do to to a great extent. So and how old is the child within you? Is that oh, the, the child within me depends on the weather. <laughs> <laughs> how old is the child within you today? If it's if I wake up in the morning and it's cold and gloomy and miserable outside, then I feel I'm eighty six. <laughs> if, if if I wake up and the sun is out. And there are birds chirping at the window, you know, and all is <laughs> bright and merry. Then I'm 16 again. <laughs> Lovely. I'm glad you're 16 because yes, we want you I'm, I'm, into this 86 into 16 mathematics. I'm influenced by the climate, I think. <laughs> and and I, I'm somehow happier in warm weather. And yet, ironically, here I live up on a mountain where it can get very cold. Um, so uh, there's no logic to it at all. <laughs> uh, take us to your childhood, your memories of your father. Well, yes, I have a uh, my early memories uh, are of uh, um, almost like fairyland. I mean, there we were in this little state called Jamnagar on the west coast of India and in Katiawa. Um, it, it was a little port, and it was um, ruled by a a prince who was called the Jam Sab, huh? and in fact, that that was the state where cricket began in India with yes. Ranjit Singh, who was the ruler once, then his nephew Dilip Singh and others. And uh, my father used to run a small palace school for the girls because they weren't sent to you know outside to schools in those days. And I would attend the classes there. Uh, and that's how I learned to read, upside down, in fact, because I would stand on the opposite side of the desk of my favorite princess and watch her reading. Oh, sweet! <laughs> hmm? uh, and uh, so, uh, and then this, it was, it was a very open sort of, uh, there, there was a city too, but uh, most of the uh, residential areas were very open. So there were lawns and gardens, and there was the sea close by. Uh, so we were there till I was about six. Then World War II broke out. My f father joined the RAF and uh, he was posted here and there. But I had two wonderful years with him in Delhi. That was 1941, 42, when I didn't go to school, which was great. Um, and um, he would, of course, he would be busy in, in the day going to the office which was at the air headquarters in South Block. But whenever he came home, he'd, uh, he'd take me out to the pictures or to the bookshops. Or if it was a Sunday, to monuments like the, the Kutub Minar or the Red Fort or Humayun's tomb. And he'd tell me the story about these places. So I learned a lot of history from him. And he collected stamps. He had this wonderful stamp collection. Um, you know, an album for different country, for each country. And from helping him with the stamps, and he'd tell me about the countries they came from. So I learned a lot of geography. And in fact, when I later went to school, I always stopped in geography. They don't teach much geography now to kids, actually. And I presume it's just uh, uh, you learn it maybe from you watching travel shows on television, I suppose. I have to check on that. I'm not sure about the geography curriculum of my little granddaughter. But yes, you must ask her. Mm. Uh, so then, you, you which bookshops did you go to with your father? He 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 died while I was ten. I uh, still at school. Mm. Oh. Then I had to adjust in a way to my my mother had. I had a stepfather. My mother had parents had separated, so I then had to adjust to uh, my mother's um, home in Dehradun. And uh, stepfather, he was a Punjabi gentleman. He was very decent to me. Um, but we had a rather upside down life because his business, uh, sort of, with, uh, the businesses he ran, which was cars mostly, uh, you know, he was always struggling. So we were always on the move from <laughs> one house to another, or uh, so there would be financial problems and things. Uh, till I was. Back off to England for, for when I but I came back after three or four years um, uh, with a book published. <laughs> Lovely, I mean, 
Ruta, in this chapter, and uh, what wonderful memories you still carry of your father. I have good memories, especially for childhood and boyhood, growing up here. In fact, in general, of course, living now in up here in Missouri for so many years, like uh, over 50 years, I think um, it, time sort of gets compressed eh? and um, something that happened maybe 20 years ago it seems to be yesterday. Anyway, it isn't, I guess time isn't passing by, it's really you and I, you know. <laughs> time is sort but of a state. Passing. Hmm? But um, you have such an intense relationship with the mountains. Uh, if you remember, we co-edited a book together on the Himalaya, which was called Himalaya Adventures, Meditations, Life. And in your introduction, you said, and I'm quoting, you said, living in the mountains is not a romance for everyone. Resting a living from the stony, calcified soil does not leave much time for poetry and contemplation. But it obviously has given you the inspiration for so much extraordinary writing. Tell us about your relationship with the mountains and with nature. The, the, well, those lines you quoted there, of course, I was referring to the, uh, the people of the hills who have to struggle for a living. Hmm? And, um, and their, their fields are uh, dependent very much on, on seasonal rainfall and they can't even grow very much in those rather, you know, stony terraces. Um, but of course I came up, I ran away from Delhi in a way in 1963-64 it was. I'd, I'd been living in Delhi and working there for three or four years. Um, and I somehow I wasn't writing well then. Um, I, I, I was dissatisfied with myself. And um, so I said, let me have a change and I knew this area of course from boyhood uh, so I that I came up I rented a small cottage down in the forest Maplewood Lodge mm -hmm. and I was there 10 years and, and for, in the beginning for a couple of years I was entirely on my own um, and uh, I, I got to know the, the forest around me quite well because it was a forested area and there were trees like um, oaks and walnuts and uh, horse chestnuts um, and a um, lot of birds, different kind of birds, even animals, a leopard would come prowling around sometimes. And um, the, uh, but uh, I was, wrote a lot, I suddenly started writing and then I turned out all, a lot of stories, including just when I started writing stories for children too. The Blue Umbrella and Angry River, Panther's Moon, um, and uh, I was even writing, selling stories abroad too. So it was a very good period mm, uh, <clears throat> from the literary point of view. And, the fa and I think I was helped and influenced by the natural world around me. I used to make wonderful, I used to make my own breakfast. It's something I don't do anymore. Mm. And uh, uh, there was, in fact, I remember in the early days, there was this uh, over-friendly crow who would come in and steal my boiled egg. Hmm? Hmm. Hmm. But I'd sort of got used to that too. So that uh, then gradually the family grew around me. Um, uh, Prem and his wife and then Rakesh was born. He helped me to plant a cherry tree, which has also become a, uh, a well-known storybook. And uh, uh, family grew up around me. So, and then later we moved up the hill hmm, to Landor. And I've been in Ivy Cottage for goodness me, 30 years, yeah, 1980. Is that 40 years? Hmm. You see, you can't count time up here. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> uh, it's timeless up in the mountains, are timeless. Hmm. Um, I can tell you how many years I was in Delhi, almost exactly. I can tell you how many years I was in London, almost exactly, but I just cannot tell you exactly how long I've been in the hills. <laughs> you know, um, Ruskin, Ivy Cottage Landor is a very famous address, but as the most famous Uttarakhandi 
of them all. I'm an Uttarakhandi too, like you. And I know that letters are often sent to you saying Ruskin Bond Masuri, and they always reach you. Do you still get a lot of letters or people stop writing letters in these days? No, no email. I, I remember all these letters you once showed me saying mm -hmm. Ruskin Bond Masuri. I, I do get letters, and of course, the, the post office knows me and all, most of the postmen too. Um, they, could, they, they come by Korea as well. Um, and uh, some of them, but just recently, um, because I think uh, maybe some uh, visitors to Missouri located me by asking around in the market where I live, and, and they were always told, above Doma's Cafe, which is a little Tibetan restaurant down the road. So now some letters even come care of Doma's Cafe. Huh? Although I, but but I, I'm not the most famous person living in Ivy Cottage, because at the other end of the building, there's Vishal Budwaj, who's got his, his, his flat there. Hmm? Indeed. He's, he's been here a few years now. Of course, he, he lives in, he has to live in Bombay, that's where. Um, well, I, I, I would vote for you as the most famous landmark, <laughs> and he can be the second most landmark. Right. Uh, yes, and there are other well-known people up on the hillside. But they come. Well, Gandor is a, is a beautiful community, uh, which yeah. you could have several novels set just on the um, Landor gossip itself. With, uh, I mean, yes. so many of you. I've, I've had such lovely evenings with you and Victor Vanity and the Pramod Kapoor and our own Lakshmi and us all the rest. Yeah, well, now we, uh, that's one thing we missed during this lockdown of over two months, I think. No gossip. That's the community <laughs> you have there. That's true. Okay. Although in, in the last year or two, I haven't been going out much. I've become more of a you know, stay at home person. Um, but that's and and I'm happy with my books and my writing and and uh, just just being at home. Mm -hmm. So Rusty. this doesn't really, this doesn't hurt me. This lockdown, no. I'm I always work from home and I like being in my room um, and in my surrounded by books. So it it doesn't hurt me. But I can see how it it does affect young people. They like to get out and about and. Uh, and of course, Missouri depends on tourism, and uh, with all the hotels closed and, and uh, no one in town, mm, uh, people are, are feeling it. Mm. Ruskin, you are the essential storyteller. You can spin a yarn out of nothing. Do oh. tell us a story, please, to all your fans. Mm. Perhaps the one about the tiger, or was it the leopard? Tiger, oh. the leopard. I remember that entrancing story you told us once in Veraton. Okay, all right. The tiger. That's when I was a, a small boy, and in, and my mother and stepfather had taken me out on to this shikar expedition um, in in the Rajaji sanctuary. At that time, it wasn't a sanctuary. You, you were allowed to shoot. And um, anyway, every all the shikaris went off into the jungle. Um, looking for, looking for game, and I was left in this forest bungalow, um, and I, I, I didn't mind because I had books to read. And there was an old bookshelf, in in fact, in in the bungalow, and um, as I was sitting in the veranda reading, and when I looked up, and suddenly in the clearing, uh, there was this huge tiger. So I quickly got up and darted inside. And shut the door and bolted the door, and then I noticed the w window was open. So I went to the window, and this tiger had it, it had come closer, you know. Uh, and um, so I closed the window. Then I realized that oh, the bathroom door was open at the back. So I dashed to the back of the bungalow and looked out, and the tiger had also circled around. It was looking for an entrance. And I think it had spotted me. And in those days, I was quite a chubby young boy. It probably made a good meal of me. So anyway, I closed the bathroom door too. And then I kept running around looking for doors and windows, which somehow were all open. And I kept locking them. And every time I looked out, there was the tiger. Anyway, I got everything locked and closed, finally. And the thud, 
thud, thud, its paw was banging on the front door. And it wasn't a very strong door, you know. Um, anyway, there, uh, I, I had to do something. So I pulled this dining table in, put it on the dining table, got onto the chair, and you know, you get those little skylights in these old bungalows. Eh? So I got through the skylight and onto the roof. And as I did that crash, bang, the door burst open and in came this tiger. And it was in a bad mood because it couldn't find me. Anyway, it, 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 it grabbed hold of a, my thermos flask and bit right through it. And then it prowled around and went out again. And then it went outside. Finally, the the, the chokidar from the uh, from the quarters behind the rest house spotted out and came out with his gun, bang, bang, bang. Of, but of course, he didn't try to. I mean, he just his shots went wild. But the tiger is anyway went off into the forest. So everything came back to normal finally. And for after about an hour, my mother and stepfather and all came home, came back to the forest without having shot anything. And he said, you all right, Ruskin? And I said, no way, we, we look at the mess here. This tiger has been in the... They didn't believe me. They thought I was making it all up. <laughs> and of course, I'm making it all up. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you were making it all up. I, I was in the audience the first time I heard you tell this story. And dear friends of JLF Brave New World, you've just been had because our friend Ruskin Bond has made up a story and got us all entranced and absolutely engrossed and on the edge of our chairs about what will happen to young Ruskin. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that was a cliffhanger, or what would you call it? Not a cliffhanger, a tiger a roof <laughs> hanger, I guess. <laughs> a tiger, <Lovely>. tiger stable. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Okay, uh, next uh, sort of question in the same vein of questions that are not about your literary career. I'm told, dear Ruskin, that you are very, very fond of Gurudas films and you have seen some of them. Which ones? And any songs or dialogues that you might remember for us? Oh, going back to um, whose films you have mentioned? Gurudas. Uh, hmm? Oh, Gurudas, of course, yeah. He was a very fine director, wasn't he? Well, I remember two or three of his films from the 1950s. That's when I used to go to the pictures a lot. Uh, sometimes English movies, sometimes Hindi films, um, usually with friends. And as we saw, well, it must have been 1955 because the one film was called Mr. and Mrs. 55, <laughs> in which he did the beautiful Madhubala. And then um, Piasa, Piasa, that's the one I remember best. It was a very romantic, sad sort of story. And Piasa. Uh, I think Wahida Rahman was the... Yes, Piyasa was Wahida Rahman. Opposite him. And opposite it, and, and it had that funny man called Johnny Walker. Mm -hmm. I, I think every film made in the 1940s and 50s somehow seemed to have Johnny Walker in it. You know, he was, he was, he sort of was in, our, in and out of all of them. Uh, of course, that wasn't his real name. I don't forget what his real name was. Um, anyway, he was a funny character and he had that that song that became famous and is still popular, the one about the way he's the, the barber, the hair cutting song. You hum it for me? You're going to ask me to sing it? People yes. don't. I'm asking you to sing. hum it, not sing it. Don't that, hum it. Sing it, okay. sing it, sing it. But uh, what a joy our audience will feel to hear Raskin Bonsing. <laughs> Sun sun sun, are babu sun, is champin me bara bara gun. And I forget the rest. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, okay, now we move to last, some serious questions, and uh, then we move on. In your book, Confessions of a Book Lover, you say, during my last two years at school, an understanding senior master, Mr. Knight, put me in the school library a capacious room a little distance from the classroom and dormitories. I was the sole possessor of the keys to this little bit of heaven. 
I would allow myself to be transported to another world through the pages of Somerset Maugham, J.V. Priestley, P.G. Wodehouse, J.M. Barry, Compton Mackenzie, John Macefield, and other successful novelists, poets, playwrights of the 30s and the 40s. That's, that's a great insight into some of the early influences. But who are your favorite writers? What are the books that influenced you in your work? And which are the books you go to again and again? Uh, that's an interesting question because just this morning, when I was jotting down some thoughts and ideas in my diary, I try to keep a, a diary too, from time to time. And I was making a little list of books that I've read twice at least, you know, <coughs> sort of favorites that I've gone back to or that I wanted to read again for some reason. And um, uh, the list, of course, was headed by Alice in Wonderland, which I must have read several times and read to others too, read to children, because uh, the, it, it's, a, it's a good story to read aloud. <coughs> so, of course, there's Alice in Wonderland. And then um, on a more adult note, the story of my heart by Richard Jeffries. He was a naturalist and uh, uh, also a, a very spiritual sort of man. And it, it's... It sort of appealed to me, uh, also as a nature lover. The story of my heart. And um, other books in that, oh, Wuthering Heights. Now, I first read Wuthering Heights when I was 12. And on a stormy night in Derudun, and the, room, the, the, the roof was leaking because we weren't in a very good house. And it kept me awake all night. Till I finished reading it about 3 or 4 in the morning, having started um, after dinner and then for many years of course I hadn't read it again and then only last year um, I picked it up casually I uh, there was a, a copy in my shelf and I started reading it again at late evening and once again I was up all night I could didn't stop couldn't stop until I'd finished it huh? so that's there's something about the the passion in it and the, you know the intensity of of the writing which which held me and still does uh, so that's another one that's uh, on my list of books that have been read twice over um, but what else is there mm, so many um are really <laughs> and of course one also often goes back to you know lighter reading too you know three men in a boat or the diary of a nobody or agatha christie or pg woodhouse and the you know, old favorites and so there they are <coughs> And what's the next book coming up, please? Um, Good to know. Let's see. Yeah, there's, there's um, the fourth in a, in a series, the Boyhood Memoirs, um, which I did for Puffin Books. And this one is called Song of India. Mm -hmm. And this, is, this one is about that last year in Dehradun, in India, 1951, before I went, sailed off to, to England. Of course, you sailed off in those days. You went by ship and came back by ship because the the air the air services hadn't you know quite got going. Um, uh, so that's about the friends I made and and about how I sold my first story and how I you know started becoming a writer. <laughs> so it, it's a little memoir, about ten thousand words. It's called Song of Wind. That should be out any day. I think tomorrow on my birthday. Normally, we'd have had a sort of book launch hmm? yeah, and uh, fun and games. This is a book launch. I wish we had a copy of the cover with us. But, and oh, I'm right. sure we'll have many more books coming out in the next month or two or three. All the publishers must be holding on to all that they're planning. <laughs> holding on. They'll all come out at once. <laughs> sure. uh, my last question is, any regrets at all? As a writer, not really, because I think I've always worked within my limitations or what I realized were my limitations, you know, um, and therefore I've, and within them I, I've worked to my satisfaction, um, done the things I wanted to do, written the sort of stories I wanted to write, and um, so as a writer, I have no, no regrets. Um, as a well, as a as an individual and in one's personal life, naturally, we all sometimes uh, can't have the things we want 
or, or you know, or, or um, you 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 might be in love and and uh, it all falls apart. So you you can't have a you know a perfect um, or a, or a perfectly happy life, but you can have a contented life. And I think by and large I've had that because I've done the things I wanted to do and given myself the freedom to do these things um, and never wanted too much. Um, never wanted too much out of life. Uh, just um, I've just wanted to be able to write, to read, uh, to have uh, a little love and affection and to give a little love and affection to others and, uh, and that's it. And um, physically, I've never been, a, I, I would say, a picture of, of health, you know, I've been always <laughs> chubby and tubby and uh, um, uh, lost in the marathon at school. So, <laughs> but anyway, here I am still around. <laughs> but uh, if I could uh, ask a last question to the last question, you said that you've written to your satisfaction within your limitations. Uh, that's um, for somebody who's written 150 books to talk about your limitations is an act of, uh, well, modesty, I would say. But how do you define your limitations? And I've perhaps written on a small scale in, 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 in that my most successful genre has probably been the short story or the novella. I haven't attempted a, a, a big book, you know, a, a long novel or a, you know, or a, or a war and peace or something like that. You know, it's I've always sort of done what I'm good, what I realize I'm good at doing, and perhaps because maybe when I was younger, when I attempted something too radical or something that wasn't in my nature, um, it it didn't come off. So I think we we have to perhaps write out of our own natures, huh? and then and then it comes off best. <laughs> That's a very wise thought as a writer to take it in. Now, before I sign off, uh, we have some very special birthday wishes for you from Vishal Bharadwaj, who has collaborated with you to bring the stories to life of the Blue Umbrella and Saat Khun Maaf. So, uh, here's your friend Vishal coming on. Hello, Eskin Sam. Happy birthday. I'm going to ask you three questions on your birthday. First one, has lockdown changed anything in your daily routine? I'm afraid not. Second one, when are you going to write a horror story for me to make a film? And how is the stock of alcohol at your place? Because I'm going to come to Masuri as soon as possible. Have a great day, Raskin Saab. Many, many, many happy returns of the day. Sending love from Mumbai. Well, um... I, he, I know that Vishal likes his whiskey, and um, my, I, but I've got a stock only of those tiny bottles of rum because the the, the liquor shop had run out of um, uh, out of the the larger ones. Huh? But I know that Rekha, his wife, she she drinks rum, huh? so I, I I can at least offer 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 them some rum. But, but what about the horror story? Oh, the horror story! I was going to. Tell myself I must now stop frightening people. And <laughs> but if Vishal wants a horror story, um, I'll cook up one for him. Um, maybe, um, maybe someone uh, uh, in connection with this this virus it's going around. Huh? Mm -hmm. I have a f it could sort of uh, get into my telephone. It, something does get into my telephone from time to time, and I used to think it's the ghost, hmm? uh, the resident ghost, but it could now be a virus huh? um, and create a little havoc in Missouri. Hmm? But um, I'll think about it, Vishal, and cook and find something horrible <laughs> to, to write if, if you really want a horror story. And there was one more question, which was Has the lockdown changed anything in your daily routine? Probably not, he says, on your behalf. Not really, except that maybe I'm getting up earlier than usual because the birds have been coming around. Uh, I've, parrots have been coming and they don't really come up at this time of year. Then um, there was an, an orange minivet the other day um, and lots of little wagtails and uh, small birds too. 
Um, that's maybe because I'm getting up earlier in the morning. Because later in the day, um, you don't see them so often. And there's the monkey that um, was outside my window too. In this morning, it comes there sometimes. And fortunately, I keep the window closed. So the monkey was there this morning making faces at me. So I made a face back at it, and it took off. <laughs> I think my face another of your stories, like your tiger story. <laughs> no, no, no. The monkeys are around all, uh, all over the place. And in fact, um, I don't know if I should tell you this. No, why not? It's a bit scatological because uh, I, one morning I, I went into the bathroom and there was this monkey sitting on the potty. Oh my God! And, uh, so I shout. I had to back away and shout and bang the door, and only then did he leave. He wasn't doing anything. He just found it a comfortable place to sit. <laughs> I say he might have been a she. I can't tell. I don't remember. <laughs> so, um, no interview with Ruskin Bond can ever be complete without a child's point of view. And my granddaughter, Anina Sibyl, sent a few questions when she heard that I was going to be speaking to you. So we'll bring on Anina with her exhaustive list of questions and let's see which of them you can answer. Hello, my name is Anina Sibyl. I'm eight years old and I wanted to ask you a few questions about your book. Great stories for children. So my first question is, how long did you take to write this book? How long did I take to write it? Well, those are uh, stories written at different, at different periods of my life. Hmm? Uh, and then they were put together by the publisher. Hmm? So um, the book itself took me no time at all because those stories were already there. Hmm? My second question is, in The School Among the Pines, why did you name the children Prakash, Sonu, and Bina? Um, I just made up the names out of you know out of a hat more or less. Uh, um, I, they they just came to me. Hmm? The, of course, the children were in a way also uh, fictitious, um, but the, the the school was perhaps based on a little school down in one of the villages close by uh, where I'd uh, gone for a walk. The characters and it, the characters, the children were based on real, on real children. So sometimes the, the, there's more fiction than fact, sometimes more fact than fiction. Um, or the, they all blend together sometimes to make a story. The third question she asked is... My third question is, how many copies have you sold of this book? Oh, you a very direct question. <laughs> very, oh, very sort of a direct book. question. Of this particular book? Yes. Uh, great Stories for Children? Yes. Uh, well, the last time my publishers did give me a figure, uh, it, was, it was around uh, 3 lakhs. Mm. Wow. Uh, I think so. Yes, you can check it with Rupa. <laughs> and kind of. Last question is, are any of these stories actually related to you or have actually happened some of them? Thank you for your time. Oh, yes, very often some of them are based on things that have happened to me or, or people or children I've known. Um, but I do sometimes fictionalize. You know, I might take an incident, an episode, and and sort of use it to develop a story around it. Um, so, while I might have seen a tiger in the forest clearing, in the story, it's actually after me. <laughs> <laughs> so, on that note, we sign off with no. felicitations across generations to one of the funniest, wisest, most generous persons I have ever encountered. No, and no, no. thank you for joining us and uh, all the best for this new birthday year. And hope no. to see you soon in Missouri. No. In Ivy Cottage, <laughs> Bandor.
Thank you. So Thank, much. You. Thank you. Thank you for, for the lovely interview. And all the I had so much fun. Raskin Bond, Namita Gokhale, thank you for that incredible session. It's been an absolute privilege to listen to both of you. Raskin Bond, a happy birthday from all of us. Thank you all for watching and being such a great audience. And sorry we haven't been able to take your questions today as we recorded this session earlier. Uh, Ruskin Bond was in Landor and we were not sure about the bandwidth uh, issue. We thank our official radio partner, Red FM, Bajate Raho. We hope you enjoyed this conversation and we'll log back at 9 p.m. for our next session for Economics, the Human Toll. Abhijit V. Banerjee and Esther Duflu in conversation. This session will be presented in partnership with York University's Festival of Ideas. Abhijit V. Banerjee and Esther Duflu were awarded the 2019 Nobel Prize for their work on poverty alleviation. They speak of the human toll of the pandemic in the world economy and the global south and discuss measures and strategies to fight back the catastrophe, including the concept of a universal ultra basic income. We now present a short extract from the archives of the Jaipur music stage featuring Papon. Angarag Mahanta, known by his stage name Papon, hails from Assam. Papon also worked as a singer, songwriter, and music director in Assamese and Bollywood films. He is the lead singer and founder of the folk music band the Papon and the East India Company. Enjoy the music and see you back at 9 p.m. Let's go to the side of the side.